this picture is a bunch of monkeys, and I think that's what we all are. I think we still share, you know, 98.6% of our DNA with chimpanzees, and I don't think you can get around the fact that we are a fundamentally uh, social creature. That's how we come to understand who we are as babies. That's how they learn so much of the world around them is the, the fact that we have these things called mirror neurons in our brain that when someone else smiles, you just kind of feel happy, and there's really no reason for that to happen other than the fact that your brain is wired to help you feel that way. So I think the equivalent of what we have today are things like Facebook and Twitter, which is the equivalent of chimpanzees sitting around, kind of quietly chirping to themselves, talking, whatever noises chimps make. Um, this is how we feel important. It's how we feel safe. It's how we feel listened to. And it's how you know we hear about uh, danger. I know, if, I don't know we're in California. Whenever there's an earthquake, the first place you hear about it tends to be Facebook or Twitter. And it's just a really important you know, the reason these services have become so insanely popular, it's not because they introduced an entirely new kind of behavior. What they did was amplify an existing need that people had and made it, you know, so ridiculously easy that now Facebook has 500 million users and counting. I think uh, per month they spend something like 700 billion minutes on Facebook, if you look at it globally. And I think per month each person generates around 90 pieces of content. So that's three. You know, it's like three things a day just being added, and pretty soon I think they're going to, you know, the writing's on the wall that they're going to become bigger than Google, which I think speaks a lot to the fact that while as creatures we like to search for information, we actually prefer to get it told to us by our friends. Another huge thing, I don't know how many people in here are gamers. I'm personally not a gamer that much. I peaked with Goldeneye for N64. <laughs> but everyone, if you're in advertising, needs to understand uh, the game space. You know, games are... Games are primitive, and I think they fall out of us being social creatures. If you think of uh, games you know, on the playground at school, games like tag or hide and go seek, or ways that we, as a young child, learn to sort of display fitness amongst our peers to show that we're faster and or more savvy. Um, I think a lot of successful teachers are able to turn school into a game of sorts to make it fun, but also to instill that element of competitiveness. Um, <clears throat> and then Atari really started the trend of making this, uh, you know, sort of popular on a mass scale. Now gaming is bigger than the movie industry. And sort of a lot of principles of game design you see in things like Foursquare, which have started ratcheting up in popularity because this whole idea of, you know, becoming a mayor. It's kind of a ridiculous concept. I'm the mayor of my apartment. I don't really know what that means. <laughs> No one else really checks in there, but it's important <laughs> for me to maintain that. <laughs> so I don't know if anyone's read this, read this book by this guy, Steven Johnson. It's called Everything Bad is Good for You. It's, the subtitle is How Today's Popular Culture is Actually Making You Smarter. And I think that runs in the face of what you read a lot. You know, are people getting stupid because people don't read books anymore and they just go to Google to find out the answer? So sort of the value of... Having a photographic memory is kind of nil when you have an iPhone on you because you can look up anything whenever you want. Uh, but he makes a pretty compelling case. And one of the main uh, theses in his book is that if you look at popular, if you look at pop culture and you look at the nature of narrative within these stories, this is just a photo I grabbed from the book. And each little one of those uh, on that like graph paper, if you read horizontally, that's kind of uh, elements within a narrative arc. And then if you go vertically, vertically, those are different narrative arcs within that show. And then you can see if they're happening kind of sequentially at the same time. So really simply with Dragnet, there was one story and it ran for 30 minutes. The people didn't change. It was just basically the story all the way through. Starsky and Hutch just has like a little blip at the beginning and the end that represents a different story. <clears throat> But then it's the whole story the way through. Then you get to something like Hill Street Blues, which is a big show in the 80s, that definitely had a more nuanced and modern narrative structure. Um, but that really gets interesting when you look at The Sopranos below that, where you could see that there are many more story arcs sort of happening simultaneously within the larger narrative of the story. And it just requires a lot of cognition and extra processing to try and keep up with all these different characters. 
how they're interacting with each other, and how these interactions affect the larger narrative as a whole. Stories are inherently more complicated now, and we actually like more complicated stories. Um, if you're, I've worked in TV a lot, and if you pitch TV ideas that actually don't have these complicated stories, like TV networks don't buy them anymore. Um, so when it comes to storytelling, you actually can't, you can't be simplistic about it anymore. Like that's no longer interesting. You have to be kind of multifaceted and a little bit messy. And I'd even argue if you look at something like Jersey Shore, there would have an equally complicated narrative arc because I think you'd have to expand it to the stories that actually happen in real life and are captured by, you know, amazing magazines like Us Weekly or websites like Perez Hilton because I think with the blending of whatever's happened with celebrity or whatever, I want someone to write a really interesting academic book about that, but those stories have actually gotten increasingly complicated because the lines have been totally blurred. And just like Hamish was saying, people like complicated stories, they like kind of closing the loops in their own head and feeling like they're a part of it. And there's this quote from this really smart strategist, Russell Davies, nobody comes out of a movie saying, that was a really good film. I really enjoyed it. It was really clear. You know, that's just not a thing. That's a, that's a not, not a natural feeling to have because that would be boring, essentially. Um, so that's led to a lot of interesting work. I mean, this is just, we didn't want to sit here and go through case study after case study, but I hope you're familiar with the funtheory.com, something DDB Stockholm did for Volkswagen, a lot of great videos there. Um, just doing a little bit of behavioral economics and making things like taking the stairs a game. I think it showed a really good understanding of how people like to play these social games with each other and how that could be motivating to change behavior. Uh, the one to the right of that, the little cartoon guys for Fiat, for EcoDrive, that was a little interesting bit of technology they built into their cars that lets you track how efficiently you were driving. So it's kind of like what the Prius does, but this was uploaded to a site. And it made a game out of you know how much mileage could you save driving if you took the right route or if you kept your speedometer in the right zone. Um, Pepsi Refresh, I think everyone's pretty familiar with. Um, Art of the Trench by Burberry is kind of a <clears throat> pretty progressive for a fashion brand, which aren't known for that being progressive. But it was basically kind of a social browsing and inspiration piece where they partnered with the sartorialist who's a well-known blogger and another uh, other couple of photographers. They also allowed for socially, for user submitted videos and it was just all focused around that classic iconic Burberry trench coat and all these different takes on that trench coat. And then another thing I really love, if you guys have seen um, those Chrome videos for Google, BBH I believe has been doing those. And that's a lot of interesting work and I think those those pieces of content just, you know, just kind of represent simple visual stories told without a lot of dialogue. It's kind of just told entirely through the action of the content of the film itself, which I think help brings to life all this kind of magic that happens in a browser. So just a couple things that uh, kind of sum up all this stuff that I think are really important to remember is that, you know, as a people, you know, we embrace technology generationally. I just saw something crazy where the average teenager receives over 3,000 texts a month. I believe that's the figure, so it's like six per waking hour, and that's on average. And that'll never change. It'll never really go back. We tend to add to our media consumption versus replace media consumption. So the, amount, the total amount of time people have spent listening to the radio has actually amazingly stayed pretty flat. We've just added iPod listening time on top of that. Um, same thing with television, we've just kind of added time on our computers because most people, or an increasing number of people, watch TV and use their computers at the same time. So it's a, an embrace that happens every generation as new technology comes out and it never goes away. Uh, we've always been social monkeys, uh, we always will be, so I think that's a reason why <clears throat> everyone gets so excited about social media because Rather than being a new thing, it's just become a new way of allowing for an existing behavior to really happen. Um, gaming has always helped define us. I think the challenges that games present and the opportunities for social interaction that they present are really important to how we've evolved as a species. Uh, we delight and seek order in the complex, so it's a really fun to try and figure out complex stories, and it's a natural human reaction to try and make sense of the complex. There's been a lot of work in like, neuro-linguistics looking at why religion exists in the first place and there are a couple of theories that it exists because people needed to make sense out of things like lightning and earthquakes and you know animals uh, eating their brother. 
and we like to feel like we're a part of something and I think that's pretty closely tied to the fact that we're social monkeys but it's also just this idea that you know if we can be part of sort of a larger storytelling experience it helps define us uh, in a way that is special and unique and that's why we sort of seek out and share these kind of unique stories with people that we consider our peers.